Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening in the name of Jesus our Lord. We ask you to cast your gaze of love upon us. Open up the ears and eyes of our heart that we might recognize your Son's presence in our lives, in the mysteries we celebrate, and that we might always hear the sweetness of his voice, of his invitation. And we ask this through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before beginning this evening's talk on a diagram of love, that is the Holy Mass, I just wanted to remind us of the theme that is the foundation for these three talks that I'm going to be doing. So this is the second of the three th talks that I'm going to be doing. And that theme that we saw last week is that God has chosen to save us not as individuals, but as a family. And I shared with you my own experience growing up in a wonderful Christian home, how important the evening meal was. And that when we would invite friends to that evening meal, my mom and dad were no longer Mr. and Mrs. Sui to my friends, but they became mom and dad. And so we saw that this experience of the goodness of life, of the goodness of family, is pointing to this higher truth. And that higher truth is that this is how God has chosen to save us. And so this evening, we're going to focus on the celebration of the Holy Mass, which is at the same time a sacrifice and a meal. And we're going to strive to flush out how it is that the Lord God reveals his love to us in the context of the Holy Mass. As I've mentioned to you, I lived in Europe for 13 years, and so I got a chance to meet people from um, all kinds of different countries and backgrounds. And one of my friends was a monk from England, and he made his first trip ever to the United States. And he shared with us um, this vision he had after coming here to the United States. He started in the East Coast, and he worked his way all the way to California. And it's a wonderful image of a journey. So he mentioned, first of all, the excitement and the joy of arriving in the new world, that is, arriving in the United States, being on the East Coast. But as he began his journey through our country, when he arrived at the Appalachian Mountains, there was that experience of that difficulty of going over the mountains. Yet, at the same time, there was the majesty and the beauty of those Appalachian Hills. Once you cross the Appalachian Mountains, you're in the Midwest. And there are a lot of cornfields. There's flat. And it's a very long journey. I remember when I drove from Wisconsin to Colorado for World Youth Day, that that was my experience. It's just cornfield after cornfield after cornfield. But then when you arrive to the west of the United States, you arrive at these majestic Rocky Mountains. And so there's the very challenging task now of crossing the Rocky Mountains. And then once you cross the Rocky Mountains, you arrive in paradise, so to speak, that is in California, the warmth of the sun, the beauty of the beaches. I want to use this image, this journey across our country as an image of how it is that we're going to approach the holy sacrifice of the Mass. I have to be honest with you that I, I struggled mightily preparing this talk. Um, I put Father Steve and Father John through a lot of trouble because my intention or my desire is I just wanted to talk to you guys about the Rocky Mountains. I wanted to bring you to the heights and I wanted to make sure you understood the profound depth of the Mass. And I struggled with this and I didn't know why I was struggling until our Lord got my attention and helped me to realize that what he's calling us to do, what he's inviting us to do is to do this journey together. That is that there's a beginning, beginning on the East Coast. And then to let you know that right away there are those Appalachian Hills. There's gonna be some difficulties and some challenges but with them come beauty. 
But then in terms of understanding what it is that God our Father offers us in Holy Mass, there's going to be that long journey through the Midwestern states. But it's worth it. It's worth it to persevere, to keep going forward, because then we do begin to arrive at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, and we get to experience this depth of God's love and what it is that is offered at the Holy Mass. And so the, the focus and the hope for this evening's talk is that as we go through the celebration of the Mass, to give us um, kind of an outline of the landscape of all that there is that we're going to encounter and discover. So I want to point out to you that in the worship books, you can find the order of the Mass, and I'm going to use this as a, a reference throughout this evening's talk. If you turn to number 202, you'll see that is where the order of the Mass begins. All right. So just as we did this evening, so too we do every time we gather together as God's family, that is, we begin with song. The reason we as Christians begin Holy Mass, we begin our worship with song, is because Holy Mass is a celebration. Now, as we go forward, we'll understand what it exactly it is that we're celebrating. Now, all of us, and Father John has pointed this out and made this observation, especially for us men, if we're at a football game, we understand the power and the importance of singing. We celebrate our team. We celebrate our heritage. And we also celebrate our victories. So as we begin to understand and experience what it is that we're celebrating at Mass, we are going to be drawn more and more to participate in the singing. One of the things you're going to notice about Our Lady of Good Counsel is we're blessed with um, an extraordinary music ministry. And so when the songs are chosen that we sing throughout the Mass every Sunday, they're not just randomly chosen. It's not as if they take the songbook and they flip it and they say, well, why don't we sing this? There's a beautiful harmony between the songs that we sing to praise the Lord and the readings, and in particular, the gospel of that Sunday. So now we're at what are known as the introductory rites. This is the way that God our Father is going to introduce us into this celebration, which is the Holy Mass. And we begin with a simple sign and gesture at the beginning of our celebration. So the priest who is to us Jesus, he begins our celebration with in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The cross, this making of the cross over ourselves is this stunning revelation of God's love for us. I want to encourage you to find other ways of expressing what it is that we're doing when we sign ourselves. I just want to give you three examples from scripture that came to me. So, so that this, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that it doesn't become um, kind of a route ritual that we do it without thinking. We don't even reflect on what it means to make the sign of the cross upon ourselves. One example would be for God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son. So obviously we say the words in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but within ourselves we can remind ourselves of what this cross means. So that's one example. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son. Another example would be the words of Jesus during the Last Supper discourse in the Gospel of John. Greater love than this hath no man that a man lay down his life for his friends. A third and a final example that I want to offer to you when we make that sign of the cross. As I have loved you, so you also must love one another. 
So we turn to sacred scripture, we turn to God's word to bring alive and to give us that deeper meaning of what it is that we're celebrating at Holy Mass. Right after the sign of the cross, we begin with a greeting. And so if you turn the next page, you'll see at the top, just above number 203, <coughs> there are three uh, options for the greetings. I want to focus on the first one. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This greeting with which we begin this part of the Holy Mass is really pointing to those glorious encounters that we find in the Gospels bet between the Apostles and the risen Lord Jesus. So right away at the very beginning we're given this tangible sign that we are gathered together, we're gathered in to celebrate the victory of God's love. The victory of God's love over sin, over our infidelities, and even over death. So when the priest begins the Mass with his greeting, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, that is pointing to, to those appearances of the risen Lord to his apostles and it's helping us to understand that what it is that we're celebrating is this victory of the risen Lord, that Jesus is with us, that Jesus is with us always. And it's the power of Jesus' love that is stronger than sin and death. This greeting at the beginning of Holy Mass is a wonderful example of the living tradition of the Church. So as we saw last week, we as Catholic Christians, we have this tremendous love, this tremendous reverence for the written word that is for sacred scripture, but we also have the living tradition which Jesus handed on to his apostles and to his church. And so this living tradition draws this greeting from, from the New Testament, from the writings of St. Paul, and it brings it alive in this celebration of God's mighty deeds that he has worked on our behalf. I don't know if you guys ever have this experience. So we begin in the name of the Father. There's this beautiful greeting. Then right away we as Catholics, we come to what is known as the penitential act. That is, we begin by asking our Lord's forgiveness. So I want us to turn now, maybe not turn, but just look a little bit further right there, number 204 we see right away that there is the penitential act. And this is the prayer very often that we say as an expression of this penitential act. What we begin to understand, because we are fallen, so Father John, when he talked about the Holy Spirit, he talked about that cry in the depth of our heart we're thirsting for authentic relationships. Yet because we carry this gift of our faith in what St. Paul would say is an earthen vessel that is we're fragile, it is amazing how fragile we are as human beings, how fragile our relationships are. And so as we begin to mature, not just spiritually, but also emotionally, we begin to discover can there be true love without forgiveness? This very um, holy, poor Clara Abbess, in one of her teachings to her nuns, she would exhort the sisters by saying, Sisters, if you truly want to love, you must be prepared to have a wounded heart. 
And so we see in the wisdom of God's holy ones and God's sons and daughters that which maybe quite often we would interpret as something negative, that is, I'm hurting, I'm wounded, as if it's a bad experience, the saints help us see, no, wait a minute. The fact that you have a wounded heart, it's actually a very good sign that you're striving to truly love those people that God has brought into your life. I want to share with you um, an experience I had as a monk. It's something we did once a month in our monastic community. So part of being a monk is we live in a very um, tight-knit community. Monks are striving to relive that Christian community that we see in the Acts of the Apostles, where they had everything in common, where they lived a life of prayer and a life of service. Well, 18 men living together in close and tight corners, there's a lot of bumping of elbows. There's a lot of people being hurt, people being offended, people becoming angry. And one of the things that the monastic tradition has passed on, which we did in the monastery um, that I lived in, it was called the Chapter of Faults. Um, I never quite looked forward to doing this. So it wasn't, wow, it's the first Friday of the month. We get to go do the chapter of faults. But at the end of it, there was always a, a salutary feeling within our hearts. And so basically this is what happens. It begins with the father of our family, in this case the prior. He would kneel down in church. Now, that um, I should say our, our monastic chapel. So it's private, it's just between our monastic community. He would kneel down in front of all of the brothers and he would accuse himself of his faults. Now these aren't hidden sins. These aren't deep dark secrets. But it's those sins, those failures that can be a part of our daily life in which we're hurting one another. So. Um, after the prior would do that, then each monk, one at a time, would kneel down before our Lord in the church, before all of his brothers, and he would accuse himself. Um, some of the things we might accuse ourselves for, um, for being short-tempered, for giving rash judgments, for being quick to judge. Um, we'd often confess coming late, so coming late to church or coming late to a meal. As a family, as a monastic family, we always experienced a tremendous amount of healing. It was refreshing that that brother who this past month has been a jerk recognizes that he's been a jerk and he's really sorry. And he's really committed to beginning again. And so that was one of the healthy things in our monastic community. By the way, very often I was the jerk, <laughs> or at least one of the jerks. Um, I don't want to be pointing fingers at my brothers. There was the excitement about beginning again as a community. So this is one of the values of why we come to church every Sunday, why we come to God's house, because we are reminded about some of the most essential things of what it means to be truly human, of what it means to truly love. We are called to love one another as Jesus loves us. Jesus loved us when we were still enemies, when we were still sinners. And so at the beginning of Holy Mass, we acknowledge our infidelities and our relationships with Jesus. So. The point of reference is not, I have this list of things that I know I'm not supposed to do. And for all those things I check off, that's, what I, that's how I ask God's forgiveness. The point of reference is how Jesus loves us. And he has asked us to love one another as he loves us. And so when I come before him, I'm going to acknowledge those ways that I haven't loved him and I haven't loved those people that he has brought into my life. To continue with this idea of 
the, the benefit of worshiping God, of coming to church on Sunday, learning these essential things, when my relationship with my Lord is not right, so if my relationship with Jesus isn't healthy, necessarily my relationship with the people I care about and I love is going to be affected, is going to be weakened. And so that's why on Sunday we have this tremendous excitement of being able to begin again, not only in our relationship with Jesus, but also in our relationship with one another. The penitential act of the church is an example, once again, of how Holy Mother Church and her tradition is drawing from the wisdom of Jesus in the Gospels. And so Jesus teaches us, don't let the sun set on your anger. We don't do well with this teaching of Jesus. There are times in our life when we like to be angry and we like to let other people know that we're angry at that person or at that situation. And so we let the sun set many times. The hope is coming into God's house on Sunday, being reminded of the tremendous and the merciful love that Jesus has for me, but on Sunday, at least on Sunday, I recognize I have to begin to let go of that anger. I am not going to carry that anger over into this new week, into this next week. So once we have acknowledged our infidelities to Jesus and to Jesus' love, Holy Mother Church already places before us a glorious hymn, and that is the hymn, Glory to God in the Highest. So as we continue along in the order of the Mass, right there on uh, number 206, we have this glorious hymn, which we sing every Sunday, except for during Advent and during Lent. So as we experience our Father's merciful love, in other words, if during the penitential rite I'm insincere, that is, I don't have anything to ask God's forgiveness for, or I'm just not paying attention, if we keep missing the boat, as we continue our journey across the United States, and as we're drawing nearer and nearer to those Rocky Mountains, we're not going to arrive at those Rocky Mountains, at those majestic summits, if we're not doing the initial part of the journey. So the penitential is right. The penitential right is important for helping us enter into this hymn of praise, which is glory to God in the highest. And so as we experience our Father's merciful love, our Father's joy and rejoicing to have us back home, to have us reconciled and restored, so we think of that image of the father that Jesus gives us in the parable of the prodigal son. That when that son comes back seeking reconciliation with his father, seeking to be united once again to his family, Jesus reveals to us the tremendous rejoicing of God the Father. He wants to celebrate the choicest meats, the finest wines. He places a new robe on his son. There's song and there's dance. And so this glory to God in the highest, in a certain sense, is also an expression of our Father's love, of our Father's rejoicing to have us, his children, gathered in his home. The first words of this hymn, Glory to God in the Highest, they remind us of the joy of the angels at Bethlehem. These are the words of the angels when they brought the good news that Jesus was born to the shepherds. The announcement of Jesus' birth of the Virgin Mary. In this hymn, Glory to God in the Highest, we also see that it's a celebration of our Father. It's a celebration of His Son. It's a celebration of the Holy Spirit. And so this hymn 
in a certain sense, is one of these majestic Rocky Mountain summits that is throughout our Christian worship. As we continue to worship our Lord every Sunday, we can dive deeper and deeper into this hymn. And it also shows us the breadth of Christian prayer. So when we look at some of those first invocations of the glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to people of goodwill, we praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. The hope of Holy Mother Church is that as we pray together as God's family during the Holy Mass, that this begins to form my relationship with Jesus. It begins to form my relationship of prayer where I begin to desire, what does it mean to praise God? What does it mean to bless Him? What does it mean to adore Him? And I'll speak more about that um, once we get to the book of Psalms. So after this hymn, Glory to God in the Highest, we come to the prayer that is known as the Collect. Um, at one point we refer to it as the opening prayer. And this is um, preceded by a brief moment of silence. At this moment of the Holy Mass, we ought to have it clear in our hearts that which we want to ask of God our Father during this Holy Mass and for this week that lies ahead. And so that's part of our preparation for Mass, as we kind of do an inventory of what's been going on in my heart, what have been the movements of my heart this week, what is it that I am in most need of, um, or maybe on behalf of somebody I care about and I love. So this brief moment of silence allows us in our hearts spontaneously to express these petitions, these intercessions to our Father. These prayers of Holy Church are steeped in God's Word and also in the living tradition of prayer. And one of the things we find in these prayers is this phenomenal blend of humility but also of unwavering confidence. Very often the collect, this opening prayer, provides us a key to open up God's word for us and to provide light for our journey. I just want to share with you um, one of my favorite colics. We heard this on the 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time. And I'm pretty sure I think it's Father Steve is going to be talking about the liturgical year. So he'll be explaining these words like Advent, Lent, Ordinary Time. So this is a prayer that we offered on the 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time. O oh God, who caused the minds of the faithful to unite in a single purpose, grant your people to love what you command and to desire what you promise, that amid the uncertainties of this world, our hearts may be fixed on that place where true gladness is found. In almost every collect of Holy Mass, one of the central themes that Holy Mother Church keeps pointing to is the reality of heaven, to what it is that Jesus promised us, to what it is that Jesus won for us through his death and his resurrection, and so this is yet another example of how when we worship God, when we come and, and pray to him as a family, Holy Mother Church is striving to get our attention. Do we desire to be with Jesus more than anything else in this life? Because Holy Mother Church is teaching us that when we arrive at that point, that I realize that the greatest thing, the greatest good to be desired is to be united with Jesus forever in the Father's kingdom. Holy Mother Church is telling us, 
When we arrive at that desire, we will experience peace, we will experience joy amid all of the uncertainties of this world. So as we come together as God's family to worship, let us be attentive to these colics, to these opening prayers, how often Holy Mother Church is reminding us of what it is that Jesus has promised us and what it is that Jesus has won for us through his cross and through his resurrection. Once the collect has been prayed, um, we finally get to sit down. So at the beginning of the Mass, we're standing. And now we come to this part of the Mass, which is known as the Liturgy of the Word, number 207. And we see that there's a first reading, there's a psalm, there's a second reading, and there's a gospel. To bring uh, to life the Liturgy of the Word, to give us a help on how it is, um, what should be our dispositions as we listen to God's Word, once again, I want to refer us to our risen Jesus and what it is that he reveals to us. And so we're going to read Luke chapter 24, um, verses 13 through 35. The walk to Emmaus. So I want this gospel passage to serve as an introduction and also the foundation of the liturgy of the word. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. This is Easter Sunday morning. And talking with each other about all these things that had happened, the crucifixion, the death, and the burial of Jesus, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, he appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he broke the bread and blessed. He took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? This encounter 
between our Lord Jesus and between two of his disciples is precisely what Jesus hopes to do for us, with us every Sunday. So during the course of the week, like these two disciples, we've been out in the world and we can become influenced by too much contact with the world and with the spirit of the world. And so we might have our doubts, we might have our fears, our anxieties, and through the liturgy of the word, so it's not about history. It's not, okay, let's take a little break and hear the history of God's people. But it's this desire of Jesus for us to recognize that we're not alone in life. Jesus desires to draw near to us, to interpret his word, to help us to understand how his word, how God's word points to him and how God's word alone can answer our most profound questions. There's the importance of being prepared to hear God's word. And one of the ways we do this is by our frequent and our daily contact with sacred scripture. So if on a daily basis I'm engaging in a life of prayer, if on a daily basis I'm picking up God's word and I'm prayerfully reading sacred scripture, I'm forming the habit of listening to God speak to me. I remember when I was growing up, I was 18 years old and I had this notion, this idea. Okay, Sunday, I give an hour to God but the rest of Sunday is mine and Monday through Saturday that's all mine and so I reduced my relationship with the living God to an hour on Sunday Monday through Saturday my life did not reflect the life of a disciple of Christ it didn't reflect the life of a son of God and so if Monday through Saturday I'm not listening to God, it's going to be very difficult to come into church on Sunday and all of a sudden think that I can have this profound and intimate encounter with him. So we're going to see this time and time again. It's important that we prepare to worship. We prepare to come together as God's family. And one of the great ways to do that is on a daily basis to be listening to his word to understand what it means that God speaks to me, what it is that God says to me, so that when we come together as a family on Sunday, his word can penetrate and transform us. So as I mentioned, the liturgy of the word is divided into, we could say, four parts. So there's a reading from the Old Testament, then there is the praying of a psalm, then there's a reading from the New Testament with the culmination in the Gospel. As we saw last week, the Holy Catholic Church venerates as the very Word of God the Old Testament. And so that's why every Sunday there is always a reading from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God reveals to us the beginning of salvation history. We see the stages of revelation we see God's pedagogy, how it is that he is leading his people. And we also see how everything is pointing to Jesus in the Old Testament. Now we come to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms are found in the center of our Bible. And there are 150 Psalms and good Bibles which, which we've given you one of them, the Psalms have titles. And so as I mentioned when we're talking about glory to God in the highest, Holy Mother Church is teaching us the breadth of Christian prayer. We praise Him. We worship Him. We adore Him. We thank Him. The Psalms is a wonderful book of prayer. It's a wonderful school of prayer. And so a kind of a concrete recommendation for this week is to open your Bible once a day to the book of Psalms. And you can just kind of look at the titles 
And you can pick a title that strikes a chord in your heart that particular day and make that psalm be your own. And so this is a, an example of how when we worship together as God's family, it's also forming us and teaching us the life of prayer as a, as a Christian. We then come to the New Testament reading and we get to see the transformation that takes place in the lives of the apostles and the lives of the first disciples of Jesus. We get to see the importance of this relationship with Jesus, with the gift of his Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, we also get to discover the formation of the church and also of the sacraments, the institution of the sacraments. With the proclamation of the gospel, the liturgy of the word next moves to the homily. The homily is that moment in which the priest or the deacon is striving to nurture our faith, to help us to discover the harmony between God's word that we've just heard proclaimed and what it is that we're celebrating during Holy Mass. So one of the things that the homily strives to do is to nurture, to awaken our faith in those mysteries that we're about to celebrate during the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. After the homily, there is the profession of faith. All that Jesus revealed about himself all that Jesus revealed about the Father, all that Jesus revealed about the Holy Spirit, as St. Peter tells us, this is not up for private interpretation. As Catholic Christians, we don't pick up the Bible, read a verse, and then interpret it according to how we're feeling or how we're feeling that particular day. The authority to define or to make this profession of faith is something which Jesus has entrusted to his apostles and to their successors, the bishops. And so um, in our own days, um, there are bishops and there are priests that don't believe in Jesus, that don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They don't believe that he's truly God's son. Now, unfortunately, this is not something that's peculiar or particular to our own times. It's been like this since the very beginning. There have been individuals that have separated themselves and have begun to define things about who Jesus is, about who the Father is, about who the Holy Spirit is. There was a moment in the history of the church in, in the days of Saint Athanasius where the majority of the bishops had become Arians. In other words, they denied that Jesus was truly God, that he's truly God's son. And so the Holy Spirit led the bishops, led the successors of the apostles to formulate this profession of faith. So this is a wonderful expression of all that Jesus revealed about himself about the Father and about the Holy Spirit. And it's something that we profess every Sunday. After our profession of faith, we come to what is known as the universal prayer. And as Jesus teaches us in the gospel, there is that special power when two of us, in the case of Holy Mass, when many of us gather together in his name to pray. And so an important part of our Sunday worship is going to be the prayers of the faithful, these prayers of petition that we make to our Heavenly Father. We're now moving um, towards the liturgy of the Eucharist. And I think I'm going to speak about the offertory and before we get to the Eucharistic prayer, we'll take a little break.
So I'll, I'll teach a little bit more and then we'll take a, a five minute break um, if people need to use the restroom. So once the prayers of the faithful, the general, um, the universal prayers have been said, we enter into what is called the liturgy of the Eucharist. The Eucharist comes from the Greek word which means to give thanks, thanksgiving. And it is one of the main titles which we learn to refer above all to the presence of God's Son, Jesus, in our tabernacles, thanksgiving. Here we see how every Sunday when we come together to worship, how Holy Mother Church is teaching us the importance of giving thanks, of being grateful. Another way to look at this is if you come to church on Sunday and you look into your heart and there's no gratitude there, it's a very good indication that in my life I'm missing something. Or maybe to put it in a different way, I'm missing out on something. So when I come to church on Sunday, if I look into my heart and I see not gratitude, that's an indication that however it is that I've lived this past week, with this celebration of Jesus' love, with Jesus' victory, I'm so excited that I have a chance to begin again, to become aware of all that we have to be grateful. The liturgy of the Eucharist is going to be that super special time within the Mass where as God's family we both celebrate His Word, which has been written down, and we celebrate His saving actions on our behalf. So as we saw last week when we were talking about divine revelation, God our Father's desire has always been both. That is this loving relationship with his written word, with that which he has said to us, but he also teaches us the importance of celebrating, of coming together to celebrate what it is that he has wrought on our behalf. And as we'll see when we get to the celebration of the Eucharist, this is the most extraordinary, the greatest way that we can celebrate all that Jesus accomplished for us on the cross and in his resurrection. It's also important that we keep in mind that it's Jesus himself who has commanded us to do this. When we get to the Eucharistic prayer and when we talk about Holy Thursday, we're going to flush this out. The beginning of the liturgy of the Eucharist, it begins with the offertory. And in our parish here, at Our Lady of Good Counsel, and in most Catholic parishes, it begins with a procession of the gifts of bread and wine. So the bread and wine are prepared, they're in the back of the church, and then a family um, is chosen or volunteers to bring up those gifts. Holy Mother Church isn't interested in um, putting on a good show. She's not trying to find images or symbols to put on a good show. She's trying to teach us something that's so important about our participation in Jesus' saving deeds. When God reveals his love to us, he's awaiting a response. And so one of the responses we make as his family is we offer to Jesus. So one of our families brings up to Jesus, present in his priest, and gives him these gifts of bread and wine. And Christians for centuries have understood this reality, this gift of bread and wine, as a symbol of all of our work, all of our sweat, all of our tears, and also in a certain sense of all of creation. St. Paul came to the realization and he invites us that in the end the real offertory is the learning to offer our whole selves. 
And so during Holy Mass, the more we learn to place our whole lives into Jesus' hands, the more we're going to experience the glorious exchange. So in a certain sense, as a priest, um, this is one of the uh, privileges. It's one of the benefits we have of being a priest of Jesus Christ is we tangibly are holding our bread and our wine in our hands and we physically are raising and lifting this bread and wine as an offering to God. And so that naturally inspires us to recognize that Jesus is, is desirous of, he's wanting us to place our whole lives into his hands. And so as we learn to do this during the offertory, we're going to experience, once we get to the moment of Holy Communion, we're gonna experience more and more this glorious exchange I offer Jesus all that I am, but then that opens me up to receive the total gift of Jesus that he's making of his self on our behalf and for us. So right now, it is eight o'clock, and we're gonna take a five minute break and regroup at 8.05, and then, um, We'll continue on with the teaching and then hopefully leaving some time for Father Steve and I to answer some of your questions. So why don't we go ahead and continue and pick up um, with our teaching. So we're drawing near um, to the most important, to the most sublime moment of the Mass. In other words, we're arriving at the foothill of the Rocky Mountains with the Eucharistic prayer. And we keep in mind that what preceded this, the offertory, and that is this desire of the Lord God for us to give him our lives, to offer our lives to him, to place our whole lives into the hands of Jesus. And once we arrive at the Eucharistic prayer, it begins with a dialogue. And so Holy Mother Church is trying to get our attention to help us be aware and be prepared for what it is we're about to experience. And what it is that we're about to experience is the Lord God in his love and his wisdom is about to offer us the grace. He's about to offer us the opportunity to stand beneath the cross of Jesus Christ, to be there with Jesus as he hangs on the cross, and to pray, and to worship, and to praise precisely in that moment, to be one with Jesus in that moment. And so our Lord present and his priests says to us, lift up your hearts. And our response is, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks and praise. It is right to give thanks and praise. And then the next part of the Holy Mass is what is known as the preface and this is very similar to the glory to God in the highest. These are extraordinary hymns which help us to understand and experience the unwavering foundation of our gratitude for all it is that God has given us in this gift of Jesus. At the end of the preface, we sing together the holy, holy, holy. This beautiful hymn, this beautiful prayer is the prayer of the angels and of the saints in heaven. It recalls to us the vision of Isaiah. When Isaiah was granted this vision of God's throne and he saw the angels of God sing holy, 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 it also recalls to us the vision of St. John when he experienced and participated in the heavenly liturgy. So now we get to the moment of the teaching where we're going to speak about the Eucharistic prayer. And before I do that, I want to speak about um, two things with you. First, I want to speak to you about the first anniversary of my priestly ordination. 
And then the second thing I want to talk to you about is the place where I offered my first Holy Mass, that is, the day after I was ordained a priest. I was ordained a priest um, on February 10th, 2005. February 10th is the Feast of St. Scholastica. She's the twin sister of St. Benedict. So for us as Benedictines, it was an important feast day for us. My prior, the founder of my monastery, Father Cashin, um, is a man of God, a very holy man. And he offered us, once we've made our solemn vows as a monk, the opportunity to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, because he himself, as a monk, when he went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, to Israel, it was a, a life-changing experience for him. And so he wanted to offer us, um, his sons, his monks, the same opportunity. So together with a dear priest, a friend of mine, and two seminarians, and my second cousin, I made this pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and it happened to fall during my first anniversary of priesthood. The day before my first anniversary, I was able to offer Holy Mass in the tomb of the resurrection. So rather than offering Mass on a table, which is awesome, it's great, I got to offer Holy Mass on the slab of rock upon which Jesus laid in the tomb and from which he rose from the dead. So that was an extraordinary experience of our faith and some profound lessons that we learn about what takes place every time we gather together in God's church, even if we don't have the opportunity to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. On my first anniversary, so February 10th, 2006, I got to offer Holy Mass on the altar of Calvary. So in the, the Church of the Resurrection, when you walk in the, the main entrance, which is the side entrance, right to your right, there's this elevated part because that's where Golgotha was. And I got to offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass on the very spot where God's Son, on Good Friday, offered the first Mass when he offered his, his life up to God in reparation for our sins. So that was an extraordinary moment in the life of my priesthood. And a side note, and a very human note, I recognize now that I made a mistake because on my first anniversary, I hit the climax. And so every anniversary since has been kind of a descent or decline because there ain't no topping that. I probably should have saved it for my fifth or my tenth or maybe my twenty-fifth anniversary, but kind of the nature of who I am, I started um, at the top. <laughs> the second thing I want to talk to you about is where I celebrated my first Mass. And so this is February 11th, 2005. Um, my monastery was in Umbria, and um, we were about an hour and a half drive from Orvieto, Orvieto is this extraordinary medieval town on top of a mountain, a walled village, a walled town. And there's one of the most um, beautiful cathedrals um, that I've ever seen, the cathedral at Orvieto. And in one of the side chapels, there is um, the miracle, the Eucharistic miracle of Bolsena, now known as of Orvieto. Now what is this Eucharistic miracle and what is it that one could see and venerate um, even today? In the year 1263, a German priest who was given the name Peter of Prague, he was making a pilgrimage to Rome because he was struggling he was beginning to seriously doubt if that piece of bread in the hands of the priest, in the hands of Jesus, really becomes the body and blood, the soul and divinity of Jesus. 
And so he was on pilgrimage to Rome with the intention of asking to be dispensed from the priesthood. And while he stopped in the small village of Bolsena, while he was offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass, at a certain moment the host began to drip the precious blood of Jesus onto the white cloth. So when we celebrate Holy Mass, we celebrate Holy Mass on a white cloth, which is known as the corporal. It comes from the Latin word corpus, because that's where the body of Jesus is laid. And so this white cloth serves a purpose to make sure that um, none of the fragments of our Lord's body um, should fall in a casual way and not be um, taken care of reverently. And so as this priest held Jesus' body in his hands and it began to drip the precious blood, it stained the corporal. And so in Orvieto to this day, you can see this corporal which is stained um, with the most precious blood of Jesus. And so that's the chapel where I was able, the day after my ordination to priesthood, I was able to offer um, my first Holy Mass. So now we come to the Rocky Mountains, to this great majestic summit of the Eucharistic prayer. And it's the summit because when we gather together as God's family to worship, all that Jesus did on Holy Thursday and on Good Friday is going to come to life. It's going to be present. We're going to be offered the opportunity to enter into communion with all that Jesus did on Good Friday and Holy Thursday. I want to begin by speaking about Good Friday because it's what Jesus did on Good Friday that will help us to understand what it is that our Lord did on Holy Thursday in anticipation. And what I'm about to, to share with you this teaching is it's a challenge and it's an example at the same time. So in our faith, in our Christian faith, our Catholic faith, we have all kinds of expressions which maybe some of us haven't heard or maybe we've heard rarely or maybe we've heard a lot. And it's Jesus' death on the cross takes away our sins. It's, he saves us from our sins. The difficulty is, if I were to come up to you and say, what does that mean? So many of us wouldn't be able to answer that question. So we have a certain familiarity with what it is that God has revealed to us, but we haven't taken the time to deepen our understanding our knowledge and our experience. And so what I want to offer now is a teaching on in what way does Jesus dying on the cross take away our sins? In which way does Jesus' death on the cross cancel out our sins? In order to do this, we begin with original sin. So if we want to understand how Jesus the sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross takes away our sin, we have to understand what sin is. And so we go to original sin. The original sin that we read about in the book of Jesus, maybe on a, a kind of a superficial response, well, we would say it was a sin of pride on the part of Adam and Eve. They wanted to be like God. But as Pope John Paul II, and as many of the saints have done, when we strive to understand original sin in, in a deeper way, we really see that Satan, the accuser, the enemy of our salvation, of our happiness, he succeeded in causing Adam and Eve to doubt our Father's loving goodness. And so that's really at the core of original sin this doubting of our Father's loving goodness. Yeah, God told you this and this, but he told you this and this because he's jealous and he doesn't want you to become like him, like he. 
I hope this doesn't sound abstract to you. This is so prevalent in our day and age, and maybe even at times it's present in our own hearts. Before certain um, sufferings, before certain losses, before certain evils, there is this doubting of our Father's goodness. There is this doubting of our Father's loving goodness. So now to ask the question in a, a more precise way, in what way does Jesus dying on the cross take away this doubt? This doubt in the Father's loving goodness. We find a wonderful answer to this in the writings of St. Paul. So St. Paul would like to take each one of us by the hand and he would like to take us to the foot of the cross. And as with the eyes of faith, I see God's Son hanging on the cross. St. Paul would say to us that if the Father did not spare his Son, what other good thing is there that God will not give you in Christ Jesus? Woe, woe to any man once God has revealed the depths of his love by giving us all that he has, by giving us Christ Jesus, woe to any man that would ever raise his fist or point his finger or doubt our Father's loving goodness. So during Holy Mass, we're offered this opportunity, this grace, to enter into communion with this tremendous revelation of the Father's love for us, this total gift that the Father makes to us in Christ Jesus. Holy Thursday, what our Lord and Savior did with his apostles on Holy Thursday was in anticipation of what Jesus accomplished on Good Friday. Jesus gathered together with his apostles to celebrate the Passover when the Lord God freed his people from slavery in Egypt by the slaughtering of the innocent lamb. And on Holy Thursday, in the words of Jesus during the Last Supper, he reveals to us that he is the Lamb of God. He is going to sacrifice himself. And at the same time, he is going to give us as food his body, and he's going to give us as drink his most precious blood. And so the words of the consecration, which we hear in the Eucharistic prayer, we hear these words of Jesus which come to us from his holy gospel. For when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father most holy, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And while they were at supper, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. 
So on Holy Thursday, Jesus reveals to us that he is the Lamb of God. He's going to offer himself as the sacrifice of expiation for our sins, and as we've seen, to remove, to cancel any doubting of our Father's loving goodness from our hearts. And so the teaching of Holy Mother Church, this teaching is rooted firmly in the Gospel, in particular chapter 6 of John's Gospel, where Jesus tells us that he is the bread of life, that he's going to give us his flesh, his food, and his blood as drink. It has been the unwavering faith of Holy Mother Church that Jesus present in his priest, every time we gather together as God's family to celebrate, Jesus, the very word of God who created all things, by his word and by the power of the Holy Spirit, transforms our offering of bread and wine into his holy and precious body and blood. St. Thomas Aquinas, um, one of our big brothers in Christ, he would come in church and he would kneel and pray before Jesus' presence in the tabernacle. The Holy Mother Church has seen in the presence of Jesus in our tabernacles as one of the ways that Jesus fulfills his promise that he's going to be with us always. And once when Thomas was praying, he began to ask Jesus, Lord, why is it that you chose to remain with us? Why are you here in our tabernacles? You're always here waiting for us, desiring for us to enter into communion. St. Thomas is teaching us that in our own life of prayer, it's a good thing for us to ask questions because Jesus answers our questions. And Jesus answered this question of St. Thomas, Lord, why did you choose to remain here with us? Jesus answered by saying, on account of friendship. It's the nature of friendship to live together and to share one another's lives. So the way that God has chosen to save us is not as some distant God way up there in the heavens. He has chosen to save us as a friend. Jesus becomes our food. He becomes our drink. He allows us to enter into communion with his body and blood so that he can save us through friendship, through sharing our lives, and through living with us. And so, as we now make this transition to the communion rite, and then with the conclusion of the Mass, we begin to understand how important it is once we arrive at the moment of Holy Communion that we open up our hearts completely to our Lord, that we allow him to come fully into our hearts and into our lives. The communion rite begins with the prayer of the Our Father. This is the prayer that when Jesus was asked by his apostles, Lord, teach us how to pray. This is the prayer that Jesus taught them. This helps us to understand the, the real nature of Christian prayer. Christian prayer is not me, as an individual, going and standing and talking before God. Christian prayer is my understanding that Jesus is calling me to stand at his side and together with Jesus and beside Jesus to speak to our Father, to participate in Jesus' conversation with the Father. After the Our Father, we come to the kiss of peace. Once again, the words of this prayer in Holy Mass are recalling to us the presence of the risen Jesus in the life of the apostles. 
The first words of the risen Lord on Easter Sunday is peace be with you. So once again, Holy Mother Church is pointing us to this moment in the life of the early church when the risen Jesus stood in our presence and he offered us his peace. Unfortunately, we can live this kiss of peace, this exchange of peace in kind of a superficial way. We use it as a chance to say hello to one another. Um, but really, what was meant by the kiss of peace is the fulfillment of our Lord's teaching in the gospel, that is, before we can approach the altar, we have to be reconciled with our brothers. And so the kiss of peace is really a fulfillment of this teaching of Jesus that we ought not to approach the altar to receive this merciful love of God if I'm not yet reconciled with my brothers and my sisters.